This is Will Stewart from OnlineChessLessons.net and I'm going to be looking at a classic game. This was played back in 1994 in Munich, Germany with Vladimir Kranich with white and Gary Kasparov with black. And uh, this game was really crazy. It's, it's a really crazy line of the King's Indian defense. I believe it's called a Bronstein variation where black actually sacrifices his queen uh, very early in the game. So we're going to see here Kremnik opens with d4, and Kasparov plays the King's Indian defense. Really no big surprise there. Um, just kind of moving through the opening. This is all very standard stuff in the King's Indian. And so after Bishop e2, e5, uh, the I guess the main line is going to be castles, knight c6, d5. And this has become very topical, uh, I guess, you know, these days in 2012. But... In this game, you know, White, White also has a lot of choices. I mean, he can play h3. Uh, I think bishop e3 is also a move. You know, there's a lot of choices for White. He can capture on e5. And here he just plays d5. And so the bonus, I, I guess the advantage of playing d5 is that, you know, let's say if you castle, well, black sometimes will take. And this, for example, with knight c6, this is the, the Gleck variation, or with c6 trying to play d5, you know, there's, there's a lot of other choices. And so the early d5, or I guess the immediate d5, uh, that's no longer possible. The drawback is that now Kasparov plays a5. He's going to play knight a6. He's going to play knight c5. And uh, I, the, the drawback here is the lack of flexibility. By committing yourself early with d5 for white, you know, now it's making it a lot easier for black. I mean, he knows he wants to immediately cement the c5 square for his knight. So that's why he plays uh, a5. Bishop g5, uh, white is just, you know, developing the pieces, provokes black into playing h6, you know, kind of weakens black's king side. And, uh, okay, knight a6 by black, I mean, this, this is a very natural move, so definitely no surprise there. Uh, white castles, now we see bishop d7. I was a little bit surprised by this move, to be honest. Um, it, it's, it's not that there's anything wrong with it, uh, it it's just, uh, it's kind of an interesting move. I mean, knight, knight c5 would be much more natural. Um, but I, I think bishop d7 is cool. It's very flexible. I think also another plan here was just directly queen e8. This plan has become definitely more popular recently. And now black can either play knight h5 to f4, or let's just say something like knight d2, right? So knight h5 is no longer possible. And maybe knight h7. And the idea is that now uh, the knight can move. You know, the queen is no longer pinned or, or whatever on d8, and black is ready to play f5 and expand on the king side. Uh, so that's another just, you know, typical plan. But bishop d7 is pretty chill. I mean, it's definitely nothing wrong with this. Uh, nice development. Maybe black is trying to posture and play c6. So knight to, d, knight to d2 here by white. Uh, very logical move. Looks like he definitely wants to prevent any knight h5 in the future. And uh, also, you know, a lot of times white will try to really secure and lock uh, and close down the, queen side, uh, the, the king side here with the idea of expanding on the queen side later. So black, he's got to rush the knight in, uh, so pressures e4 a little bit. And now we see b3. And the idea with b3 is that if white plays a3, black is definitely going to respond with a4. And this really fits in. I mean, this is a very uh, common fixture in the king's Indian. The pawn on a4, white has walked straight into a clamp on the b3 pawn, and basically black's knight on c5 is going to remain one of the better pieces in the game if white tries to kick it out. Let's just say something like this. Uh, the pawn structure is pretty easy to play for black. I mean, he can also try to stick another knight on c5, but uh, basically just, just speaking about pawn structure here, uh, it's going to be very easy for black to double or triple up on the white a-pawn. You know, just for example, that's, that's going to be a constant weakness. So that's the idea with the clamp. Um, you know, if a3, allow an a4 and stuff. Um, that's the idea with b3 here, is that let's say black plays, you know, kind of a, the plan I was outlining earlier, queen to e8, getting ready to move the knight. You know, breaks, breaks, the, breaks the pin. Um, now let's say a3, and this is probably what Kramnik went to do. You know, you'll notice that with b3, it's a little bit slow, but now this, this a4 clamp is just not going to work. Um, so, you know, let's just say it's a normal plan, a3. And, you know, if white gets in this b4 move, well, now the knight on c5 looks pretty silly. 
and it's going to have to go back. And it's no longer got any good square. It's actually really uh, quite out of the game. You know, it's going to be tough to to use this knight. So anyway, um, this is you know just a little background, some basic uh, basic tricks in the King's Indian. That's why b3, right? So trying to prevent the clamp up with a4. It's a little slower, but you know it's going to be effective for getting space. But here, uh, I guess this isn't specifically the Bronstein variation uh, that comes about through a different move order, but the basic idea is the exact same. Black plays knight f takes e4. And uh, if you've never seen this type of sacrifice, you're probably going to be really confused here because it's very unique. Black is sacrificing his queen here. It looks like he's just getting his pawn, so let's check it out. First of all, what happens if white tries to decline the sacrifice? Well, if he just takes the knight, black's going to get the dark squared bishop. White can even mess up his pawns a little bit. Um, and let's assess what just happened. I mean, black just won a pawn, and he picked off white's dark squared bishop. You know, this is just an, a, a huge advantage for black. I mean, you really can't ask for more in the opening. Extra pawn, you got the two bishops, especially the dark squared bishop in the king's Indian. So basically, white has to uh, accept the sack. You know, he's got the knights hanging, and his bishop is also hanging. And so he takes the queen. Black's going to capture the knight on c3 now. So he's attacking, uh, you know, snatching a piece and attacking white's queen. He's got to go to e1. And rook takes d8. Uh, it's kind of an interesting choice, I thought, to take with the f rook. I mean, rook, rook a takes maybe a little bit more natural as far as just getting ready to play on the king side where um, black's got the better pawn structure you know black would really like to play moves like e4 open up this monster bishop on the long diagonal but uh rook f to d8 maybe is like a little bit more prophylactic uh, black has got to be careful i mean let's assess the position he's got a bishop a pawn and a knight for white's queen so the two pieces you know the bishop pawn and knight are essentially worth seven points and white's queen is worth nine points. And so it's kind of like black just sacked like kind of a piece. Like, you know, at least a, a few pawns if you count the material. But this position is so dynamic that you can't really just assess it, you know, quantitatively. It's, you can't put numbers on positional intangibles. And the intangibles really are all in black's favor. And I think rook f takes d8. The idea is prophylaxis. It's that... Uh, if we look at the position, we try to figure out where is white going to be playing. You know, where is white going to be trying to generate activity? Uh, I, I don't really see anywhere else but by playing a3 and b4. It's very, very difficult or impossible uh, for, black to, for white to play g3 and f4. And in fact, I don't really think it makes that much sense. I mean, f4 here immediately, just, just to show you know, how tough it is to play for white, it just loses. I mean, you just you're going to drop all of your pieces. I mean, that's a free rook, right? And now black, I mean, you know, you can't just give away a rook. White's not of that much material. So, okay, so f4 is impossible. Honestly, I mean, looking at this position, it's, it's, it's really tough to come up with a good move for white. And that kind of makes me think that the sacrifice uh, is, is probably pretty legit. <laughs> you know, so it's, it's a very interesting idea to watch out for. Um, I think maybe the best move for white, I mean, honestly, I, I really don't know. I, I was thinking maybe king h1 is an idea. Maybe also trying to play g4. You know, we know that black would like to play f5, so he's g4. Um, the idea for white would be just open lines. You know, white, white really can do anything just trying to get counterplay. But um, in the game, I mean, also a3 right away. This would be logical. Maybe this... Uh, b3 pawn would become a big weakness then you know that's definitely possible maybe rook a6 trying to slide the rook i mean it's a weird idea but it actually seems pretty effective um or maybe just black's just gonna play e4 and now you know it's very very difficult position to play uh, for white so anyway in, in the game kramnik he played rook c1 and he dropped another pawn right and so now after rook back, knight to b4. You know, I mean, I'm sure he saw he was giving away a pawn. Maybe he was trying to sacrifice it just to get a little bit, uh, to gain a move, you know, to get a little tiny initiative. And also, you know, he's got the open a file. So whatever that's worth. But long term, he, he no longer has prospects of playing a3 and b4. And um, this is going to be a tough position. I mean, now black has a bishop, knight, and two pawns. 
for whites queen. So now, you know, if you look at the numbers, black's only down one point. It's only down one pawn. It's not that bad. Uh, in this position, he's threatening knight to b4, or knight, knight to c2. So white plays bishop d1, trying to defend, and, and also, uh, I guess, trying to stop, you know, overprotect the b3 pawn. So now we see e4, and this is a very dangerous position for white because now black's, you know, black's bishop is cutting the board in half. Where to put the rook? You know, he, got, he tries to go to b1, and now black plays rook e8. And uh, it, it was definitely possible to play just f5 here. Um, you know, this move, f3, just this is a great example. I mean, check, e3, and white is misplacing his knight. It's going to lose a piece. I mean, just look at, look at the activity of black's pieces in the center. So I, I think the idea, you know, f5 really is very logical, getting ready to just jam the pawns out. But I think the idea with rook e8 is maybe he's thinking about some kind of uh, way to open the position, you know, and win some material with e3. Also, I, I'm thinking that he wanted to play something like bishop f5, where white's rook uh, really will probably get lost. That's, that's what it looks like. At, at some point, bishop f5 just said timely, you know, to chase the rook. Uh, white plays queen to e3, so he, he definitely stops any, you know, let's say, just in case black was thinking about something like this, which he definitely could be. Uh, this, this is pretty tough to play against. Uh, so white tries to blockade with the queen, usually not what you want to do. Now f5, so black's going after the queen, h4. White is really just trying to slow down, um, just, to, just to slow black's pawns down. And so rook f8. So let's think about the material balance here. I mean, we still have uh, white's queen for a bishop, knight, and two pawns. Material's almost equal. You know, if, if black can win another pawn, I mean... But, you know, it would be numerically equal. But, I mean, if you think about just the intangibles, I mean, looking at the position here, white has absolutely nothing, right? He's got no coordination in the, in the position. His knight is very passive. It's just defending. The bishop is just defending. He doesn't have one source of counterplay here. Meanwhile, black's just chilling. You know, he's hitting the b3 pawn. Uh, he's about to jump in at d3, and he's preparing a big pawn storm uh, on the center and, and really against white's king. White tries g3, he's trying to slow down the pawn storm, it's definitely understandable. And black uh, essentially completes development. The rook is really no longer needed. You know, b6 can protect the a5 pawn just fine. And uh, now black is really getting ready to, to start some serious threats. Very instructive also. I mean, playing the rook 88. You know, I mean, you got to think, I mean, there's definitely moves like knight to d3 here. Uh, this is, but, it, you know, the last thing black really wants to do is allow trades. Because the clearer the position becomes, you know, the less pieces we have on the board, the clearer the position will become, the easier it's going to be for Kramnik with white to start using his queen and, and maybe um, some weaknesses could open up in, in black's position. So black doesn't want to trade. He's got more space here. He's got the initiative. So instead, before starting anything crazy, you know, before moving any of his pieces, completing the developments, it's, it's really, uh, you see this a lot you know, in strong players' games where instead of going crazy, jumping wildly into complications, they just complete the development, they consolidate the position completely, and then you're going to start trying to push forward for the decisive breaks. So king to g2, it's kind of a weird move. I, I just don't know what else white can do. Um, really, I mean, it's, it's kind of incredible. I mean, f4, I guess, you know, you can kind of consider this. First of all, I mean, what about just takes... Now he's got to take. Did this even benefit White? This this opening of the the file here. I'm not even sure. You know the the position still looks very dangerous. Um, there's ideas of coming in here. There's ideas maybe of G5, bringing the knights over to attack the king. This is a mess. Um, let's just, let's just say a quick line, just like check, and um, you know maybe knight here with the idea of following up with rook E3. I mean this this looks. Pretty sketchy. Very, it looks very sketchy uh, for white. So anyway, in the game, Kramnik goes king g2, so he's kind of waiting. Um, black starts jumping in. White plays rook g1. This is a weird move. It looks like he wants to prepare that after f4, and pawn takes, the rook is going to be on an open file. So it's, it's a weird move, but it makes sense. You see f4. Black just breaks the position open. Still with, you know, a bishop, knight, and two pawns for the queen. All right, so material is not everything. 
Uh, a lot of times, you know, the position, the initiative, stuff like that, the intangible factors are, are more important. White tries to fix the pawns, keeping the, the king side closed. Now he's defending on f2. You know, it's, it's interesting. I mean, White is kind of able to um, offer to sacrifice back a lot of material just because of, you know, he's got some extra material. So if, if Rook takes, uh, I suppose it's possible to take this and just sacrifice. And we have a really weird position. Um, let's say king takes, probably not going to work out. Um, you know, maybe maybe he doesn't even take the rook here. If you think, maybe just king h1. And now we're going to see, like, you know, white is at least getting some open files, getting at least getting some play. I mean, let's say, like, he pushes the pawn, maybe bishop g4. And all of a sudden, white's position is going to kind of jump to life. So black's got to be very careful, you know, with this. Uh, he, he's still down a lot of material, so he needs to make sure the position doesn't open up unless he's going to be winning at least a piece. So he plays g5. See rook f1. Uh, rook h4, you know, I, I think he's just maybe threatening some type of bishop h3, knight f4 idea. Um, also, so, so white just stops it, just covers the square here. And rook f4, I mean, also, you know, you could think well, bishop check, rook takes, knight f4. Uh, this is an interesting idea, but maybe after king h2, and we're going to, you know, after all these exchanges, I mean, let's, let's reevaluate here. Um, I think black is still up two pawns, but with these opposite colored bishops and just kind of how the pawn structure is set up, white might be able to draw this. You know, he's, he's got decent drawing chances. So black, I think, has got a much better position. So in this position, instead of bishop h3, we, we just looked at, he brings the rook back and now brings his last, uh, basically, you know, almost his last piece into the game. I mean, I guess this, this bishop can come into the attack a little bit later as well. So here, I mean, the first move I looked at was how to undermine uh, Black's knights, you know, how to undermine Black's, Black's pieces in the center. Knight takes e4 is an idea, but I think it just, this rook takes e4, it really does nothing. It doesn't do anything, it doesn't break any coordination. Uh, White tried f3, this is the other candidate move you got to consider, and he's, he's struggling for activity. I mean, if, if White can undermine this d3 knight, you know, he can undermine the knights in the center, that's going to be a big plus. And, um, you know, if he can open some files for his rooks, for his heavy pieces, then he's going to have some chances. He's, you know, that's the, only, that's the only way white is going to be able to hold on here is he's got to get some play. He's got to get some activity. So he tries f3. Black goes back, rook to h4. Trying some tricks. Maybe threatening knight f4. Trying to get the bishop in the attack as well. And so here white uh, decides to capture. We see some checks going after white's king. And now Kasparov brings the other knight in. One idea that's possible here, maybe c5, trying to get the bishop all the way in the attack. But it seems a little bit too slow, right? Um, let's say like, I don't know, bishop here, c5, this en passant. You know, now he's, it's going to take way too many moves. Not to mention white can cover it with like knight f3, for example. Um, so here after knight, knight to d3, White tried e5, and it looks like he's trying to avoid, uh, basically he's just trying to get some play. I mean, this pawn doesn't matter. You see this kind of sacrifice a lot. It's very thematic. Uh, he's, he's trying to disrupt black's coordination a little bit. And also now he's got the e4 square. You know, he can bring his knight here. Maybe later in the game his bishop will have an open diagonal now that the pawn has moved. Black snatches the pawn. Uh, White uh, tries to get his rook in the game a little bit. So rook c1, maybe he's trying to play c5, it's possible. See rook h3, very sneaky move by Kasparov. And Kramnik tries to defend, I mean, it's already an incredibly difficult position. Uh, queen e4, bishop f5 maybe? I mean, yikes, yeah, that's a lot of coordination. Tries knight f3, we see g4, uh, just, just exploiting the pin. White tries to sack the queen back. This is a common tactic. You know, when you're down material, you got to watch out. Someone can sack it back. Uh, Kasparov captures. And so we can evaluate this resulting position. Black is still up two pawns, but with the opposite colored bishops, it's possible that White's going to be able to uh, construct a, a blockade. And uh, he's got some drawing chances, but his king is so messed up. Kasparov just closes the game out very accurately. So he starts with a check. 
trades rooks. You might think this is crazy. How's he going to attack trading rooks? And it looks like he can almost trap this knight with rook e7, but white can snatch the pawn, and he's got a last second uh, defense here. But in the game, after capturing, now g3, and uh, black's plan is very easy, right? I mean, he just wants to play knight f4 and g2. That's about it. Uh, you know, he's he's getting ready to, to push decisively. And after king g2, knight f4 anyway, white just resigned here. Uh, basically, if king g1 or h1, you get mated on the spot. And if king f1, uh, I would probably just play bishop d4 because white doesn't help with spot. He can't prevent g2. And after g2, black is going to make a queen and, and, you know, a checkmate or something. So just to review really quick, I mean, this game was really cool. A great example of uh, material imbalances. And so we start off the King's Indian in early d5. You know, we see black uh, getting ready to jam the knight at c5. This makes a lot of sense. Bishop d7, so it's kind of a weird move, but it's flexible. It's, it can't be bad. Uh, knight c5, getting, you know, putting a little pressure on this guy here. It make, makes a lot of sense. And uh, b3, you know, it's... it's Stuff to criticize b3 is a very normal move. I mean, I, I guess maybe queen to c2 would be the, you know, I guess maybe what people would recommend. Queen c2 is just kind of overprotect the e4 pawn and then play b3 and a3, you know, and, and going for b4 and whatnot. Um, b3, you know, just unsuspecting. And this, this version of Bronstein sacrifice, the Bronstein variation, the King's Indian, just sacking the queen. And, and after this, I mean... No guts, no glory. I mean, Kasparov just runs this. He runs the table. Um, the bishop, pawn, and knight for the for the white's queen just proves to be overwhelming. It's a really instructive example of once black got the initiative after this um, after the sacrifice. Once black got the initiative, I mean, he never let go. You can see Kasparov almost every single move is creating a new threat, really wasting no time. But also very careful, you know, very, uh, very strong prophylactic moves, making sure that black doesn't move too quickly and allow any weaknesses in his position that white could exploit. You know, it's very important. I mean, it, when, when you sacrifice material like this, you can't get too carried away. I mean, you got to make sure white isn't going to be able to sacrifice back coming into a favorable position in game and whatnot. Um, or that, you know, white isn't going to be able to open the position and, and use his extra material, you know, use that queen. And so I think that's really the thing to learn from this game is that Kasparov made his two pieces and pawn and whatnot. Uh, he, he made those stronger than white's queen. He was able to manipulate the position to where white's queen had no targets to attack. Uh, like looking at this position, I mean, maybe you could think queen a7, but it's too late. You know, going that crazy with the queen going after white, uh, black's pawns and everything, uh, but white, white's probably just going to get checkmated. It's too risky. You know, so that's a huge thing to learn from this is, uh, you know, this, this type of sacrifice, really dynamic, creates a very imbalanced position. And how to turn this dynamic imbalance in initiative and how to convert that into a winning attack. So this is Will Stewart from OnlineChessLessons.net, and thanks for tuning in.